Welcome to Driver D Trains. Thanks for stopping by. I'm your host, Driver D. Our conductor and brakeman, Scratchy C, is out inspecting our train. In my last video, the first in a series, I introduced you to the basics of JMRI, the Java Model Railroad Interface, and demonstrated how we can use JMRI's Decoder Pro app and JMRI throttles with DCCEX to program our locomotives and control our trains. If you haven't already seen that video, be sure to check it out! In this video, the second in a series, I will walk you through the process of downloading and installing JMRI and getting started with the Decoder Pro app to create a roster of our locomotives and program our locomotives decoders. In my next video, I will show you how to set up custom JMRI throttles to run our trains and how we can use the Y throttle and engine driver apps with JMRI. Later, we'll look at some of the more advanced features of Decoder Pro, including some of the JMRI features specifically designed for DCCEX as well as how to use a variety of physical throttles and controllers with JMRI to operate our locomotives. This initial series of videos will focus on JMRI's Decoder Pro app and throttles for controlling our trains. I'll come back to the Panel Pro app and turn out control later. Be sure to check this video's description for links to the other videos in the series, as well as the various websites and products I mention here. Also, if you are enjoying the videos, please leave a comment and hit the like button. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. This locomotive is fresh out of the shop, so let's notch up the throttle and see what she can do. Installing and Configuring JMRI Decoder Pro Now that we've seen a few of the things that we can do with JMRI's Decoder Pro app and JMRI throttles, let's download and install JMRI for ourselves and try it out. We'll look at how to use Decoder Pro to read and program a locomotive and add it to our locomotive roster. Then we'll look at how to configure our decoder settings and save our work. Here's an overview of the startup sequence from the Engineer's Operating Manual. First, we'll download and install the latest version of JMRI and the necessary Java runtime environment we need for our computer. Then we'll run JMRI for the first time and initialize some settings, including the connection settings for our command station. After that, we'll add some locomotives to our roster and look at how to use Decoder Pro to program them. Then we'll save our locomotive settings and run some trains. The prime mover is purring like a kitten, the air lines are charged, and all the switches are set. It's time to notch the throttle, release the brakes, and move on out. Installing and configuring JMRI Decoder Pro. Step 1. Download and install JMRI and the Java Runtime Environment. Now that we're ready to try JMRI for ourselves, we need to download and install a suitable version. As I mentioned in my last video, over the past 20 years, numerous versions and updates of JMRI have been released. These JMRI releases and updates are grouped into five high-level version families. The current release family is version 5. Information about all of the JMRI releases and versions is available on the releases page on JMRI's website. I'll include links to the releases page and all the other websites I mentioned here in this video's description. The JMRI version 5 family started when version 5.0 was released in June 2022. As of March 2024, the latest production release is version 5.6. This release will work on almost any computer manufactured during the last 12 years, 
including PCs running Windows 8.1 or newer and Macs running Mac OS 10.11, El Capitan or newer. If you have an older computer or want to run a prior version of JMRI, you can find more information on JMRI's releases page and the installation guides linked there. For this series of videos, I will be using the latest JMRI production release, which is currently version 5.6. This version was released in December 2023. JMRI also makes available various test releases, which you are welcome to experiment with if you like. You can do this by going to the Test Release Notes webpage and then using the appropriate GitHub download link for your computer. JMRI expects to publish its next release, version 5.8 around June of 2024. We will now download the version of JMRI we need for our computers. We will do this from the JMRI releases page. Scroll down the page to find the latest production release, 5.6 in this case. For the current release, there are separate versions for Mac, Windows, and Linux computers. We'll select the version we need and click on the GitHub download link. This will download the file to our downloads folder. For the Mac, this will be a disk image file. For Windows, it will be a .exe installer file. We'll come back to these in a minute after we download Java. As I mentioned previously, JMRI is written in Java and can run on any computer that can run Java. But this means that in order to run JMRI, we need to have Java installed on our computer. There are many different versions of Java. We will need Java version 11 for the version of JMRI that we are using. There are also numerous different sources from where we can get Java. For this video, we will obtain Java from a company called Azul Systems, which provides Java-based solutions to numerous Fortune 500 companies and international brands, and is recommended by JMRI. While there are links on the JMRI releases page to the Azul Systems download page for Java, they don't always connect to the version that we want so we will select that ourselves. To do this, we will start by going to the Azul homepage at azul.com and then click on the Download Now button in the top right corner of the page. Again, I will include a link in this video's description. We'll scroll a little ways down the page where we'll find a group of four menus that we can use to locate the exact version of Java that we need. In the first menu for the Java version, we'll select Java 11. In the next menu, we'll select our operating system. In this video, we'll look at Mac and Windows. Then we'll need to select our computer architecture. For Windows, we'll need to indicate whether our computer uses a 32-bit architecture or a 64-bit architecture. We can find this in our computer's system settings. For Mac, we'll need to indicate whether our computer uses an Intel CPU or uses one of Apple's own M1, M2, or M3 processors. Again, we can find out by choosing About This Mac from the Apple menu. If our Mac has an Intel processor, we will select the x86 architecture. If it has an Apple M processor, we will select the ARM architecture. After we choose the architecture for our computer, we will finally select the Java package we want. Java download packages generally come in two configurations. The first type of package is called the Java Development Kit or JDK. The second type of package is called a Java Runtime Environment, or JRE. This is what we will need for JMRI. Note that we do not want the JRE FX package, as this is designed for a Java offshoot called Java FX. Again, for JMRI, we want the JRE package. Finally, there should only be one option left available to download. When we hover our mouse over the download button, we will see a couple of options for the type of download file. For the Mac, we want the zip file. We do not want to download the DMG file. We will click on the zip file option and this will download a zip file containing the Java 11 JRE to our downloads folder. For Windows, we want the Microsoft installer file, not the zip file. So we will click on the .msi installer file and it will download to our downloads folder. We can now close out of the Azul website. We have now downloaded all the items we'll need and are ready to install JMRI and the JRE. The installation process is different for Mac and PC. We'll look at the Mac process first. 
On the Mac, we'll go to our Downloads folder and double-click on the JRE zip file we downloaded. This will create a folder with the same name as the zip file containing all the parts of the JRE. We need to rename this folder to be exactly JRE. Once that's done, we can install JMRI. We will double-click on the disk image we downloaded. This will open a new window with the JMRI folder and an alias to our Applications folder. Do not drag the JMRI folder into the Applications folder just yet. Instead, we will drag and copy it into our Downloads folder. Next, in our Downloads folder, we will drag the JRE folder into the JMRI folder. Now, we can finally drag the JMRI folder into the Applications folder. We can close up the Downloads folder and eject the JMRI disk image from our desktop. Now let's look at the installation process for Windows. First, we'll go to our Downloads folder. Then we'll click on the Zulu installer file to install Java on our computer. We shouldn't have to change any of the default settings. When the installer is done, we'll click Finish. Next, we'll double-click on the JMRI installer file to install JMRI on our computer. Again, we shouldn't have to change any of the settings. When the installer is done, we'll click Finish. We have now installed both Java and JMRI on our computer and are ready to start using JMRI Decoder Pro. Step 2. Launch JMRI and connect to the command station. Before we launch JMRI, we need to make sure that our command station is powered on and either connected to our computer or that our computer can connect to it. This could mean that we connect our command station to our computer using a cable, such as a USB or Ethernet cable, or that our computer can connect to our command station over Wi-Fi. As I mentioned in my previous video, JMRI supports two dozen different brands of DCC command stations, including both commercial and open source systems like DCC-EX, and the exact way that we connect our computer to the command station will depend on the type of command station we are using. For this series of videos, I will be using JMRI with the DCC-EX command station I assembled in prior videos. If you have another type of command station, you can find information on how to connect JMRI to your command station on the JMRI hardware support page. I'll include a link to the hardware support page in this video's description. JMRI connects to DCC-EX either via a USB cable connected to the Arduino or over Wi-Fi. For this video, we will start by connecting DCC-EX to our computer with a USB cable. Then we'll set up a second connection via Wi-Fi. Now that we have installed JMRI and the Java runtime environment, and our command station is powered on and connected to our computer, we are ready to launch the Decoder Pro app for the first time. On the Mac, we can find Decoder Pro in the JMRI folder in our Mac's Applications folder. On the PC, we can find a shortcut for the Decoder Pro app on our Windows desktop or in the Startup menu. For the rest of this video, I will be demonstrating Decoder Pro using a Mac. Everything for JMRI should be the same for Windows, although some of the computer system menus will be different. The first time we start Decoder Pro, we may see a message from our computer asking us if we are sure we want to open it, along with a similar message for the Azul Zulu JRE. We'll confirm that yes, we do want to open these. Then we will be greeted by the JMRI startup wizard. The first thing we will need to do is confirm our language and, if desired, enter an owner name. We can also leave the owner name blank if we want. We then need to select the type of DCC system we are using. As I mentioned before, we will be using DCC EX for this video. JMRI uses the DCC++ name for all the variations of the DCC++ and DCC EX Arduino-based command stations, so we will select DCC++ from the menu. Next, we need to select the type of connection. Since we are using a USB cable for this example, we will select Serial Port from the menu. Then we need to select the specific serial port our command station is connected to. 
This will be the same port we used in the Arduino IDE when we first installed the DCC EX software. On the Mac, this will be a USB modem port, not a Bluetooth port. On Windows, it will be a COM port. Note that on the Mac, there are two versions of the port listed, one that starts with CU and another with TTY. The technical differences between these two ports harken back to the early days of computer networking when serial communication was slow and often handled over finicky phone lines. For us, these distinctions don't matter too much, and either port should work. However, to be technically correct, we will want to choose the CU, or call-up port, as JMRI recommends. JMRI will then give the connection a name, along with a prefix. If we like, we can change these. Each prefix must be unique and consist of a single letter, optionally followed by a single number. In this example, I will add the number 1 to the D prefix that JMRI created. I will also change the connection name to DCCEX and add USB to the end of the name. Later, when we create a Wi-Fi connection for our DCCEX command station, we can call that connection DCCEX Wi-Fi and give it the D2 prefix. There are some additional settings available if we click the checkbox, but we don't need to modify any of them. We are now ready to click the next button and then finish. Our initial JMRI setup is now complete. The Decoder Pro app will open with a getting started screen, ready for us to add our first locomotive to the roster. There are a few things to note before we go on. First, whenever we connect JMRI to an Arduino based command station like DCCEX using a USB cable, the command station will reboot. This is the same behavior we saw with the Arduino IDE and the EX Web Throttle app. This is inherent in the design of the Arduino, which reboots whenever a new serial connection is opened through the USB port. Unfortunately, sometimes the timing of this reboot causes JMRI to think that it has no connection to the command station. If this happens, just quit JMRI and try again. On occasion, you may have to try more than once. Finally, let's create an alternate way for JMRI to connect to DCCEX wirelessly. If you installed a Wi-Fi shield on your command station as I showed you in my prior series of videos, we can connect JMRI to DCCEX over Wi-Fi. To do this, we'll go to the Decoder Pro menu in the menu bar and select Settings. We can also do this using the Control or Command comma keyboard shortcut to open the menu. The first entry in the list of settings is Connections, which is what we want. At the top of the window, in the middle, we will see the DCCEX USB connection we set up with the startup wizard. Just to the right of this, we will see a plus sign. We'll click on the plus to create a new connection. Now we have to repeat the same steps we used when we set up the first connection, but this time we will set up the connection for Wi-Fi. We'll do this by choosing the DCC++ server connection. Next, we'll enter the IP address for our command station. We can see this in our command station's LCD display or in the debug console of the EX Web Throttle app as I described in prior videos. As when we connected the Y Throttle and Engine Driver apps to DCCEX, we need to make sure that the computer running JMRI and our DCCEX command station are on the same network. If you need a refresher on how to do this, see my video on configuring DCCEX Wi-Fi. For this example, we will use the station mode address, but if we wanted, we could create separate connection profiles for each possible address, and JMRI would try them all and connect by whichever methods it could. We'll also create a new connection prefix and give the connection a new name, DCCEX Wi-Fi, in this example. Finally, we need to click on the Additional Connection Settings checkbox and change the port number to match the port DCCEX is using. This will most likely be 2560. Again, DCCEX will tell us the port number in the display and debug console. We have now created two ways to connect JMRI to DCCEX, and in fact, JMRI will connect to both of them at the same time if it can. While there are scenarios where we might want to have JMRI make more than one connection to a command station, we aren't ready for that yet. So to avoid confusion, we'll also click the Disable This Connection checkbox at the bottom of the window. 
This will continue to direct JMRI to connect to GCCEX using the USB cable. However, when we are ready to switch to using Wi-Fi, we will simply disable the USB connection, enable the Wi-Fi connection, and restart JMRI. Note that when we connect JMRI to the DCCEX command station using Wi-Fi, the Arduino will not need to reboot. For now though, we'll click Save and JMRI will ask us if we want to restart JMRI now or wait until later. We can wait until later since we're going to keep using the serial USB connection. We just need to remember that when we are ready to quit JMRI, if it asks us if we want to save our settings, we need to say yes. We have now completed our initial setup of JMRI and are ready to add some locomotives to the roster. We'll be running trains in no time. Step 3. Adding locomotives to our roster. Now that we have installed JMRI and established a connection to our command station, we can start adding locomotives to our roster and learn how to program them. This is what Dakota Pro was made for. In order to begin, we will need to place a locomotive on the programming track connected to our command station. For this example, I will use this Atherin Genesis Southern Pacific GP40-2 with a Tsunami 2 sound decoder in it. Since this is our first time programming a locomotive with JMRI, we will take some extra time to look around and try some of JMRI's different features and get familiar with them. This will make programming locomotive decoders in the future a breeze. We also need to make sure that the programming track is powered on. Decoder Pro has a power button at the top of the roster window that we can use to turn the track power on and off. If the button is green, the power is on. For DCCEX, the default setting is that JMRI will turn the power on and off for both the main track and the programming track at the same time. However, for some command stations, we may need to take additional steps to activate the programming track. If necessary, refer to the instructions for your command station if you are unsure how to do this. Once we have our locomotive on the programming track and make sure that the programming track power is on, we will press the New Local button in the Decoder Pro menu bar. This will open JMRI's list of known decoders. We can then press the Read Type from Decoder button at the bottom of the window. JMRI will scan the decoder to identify its manufacturer, model number, and version. JMRI will then highlight the appropriate decoder entry in the list. In this example, we can see that JMRI identified a decoder from Soundtracks. More specifically, an OEM version of the Tsunami 2 diesel sound decoder designed to be factory installed in an Atherin Genesis locomotive. Looking more closely at the specific version of the decoder that JMRI identified, we can see that it is designated as a model GN2208. A quick search of the Soundtracks website reveals that this is an 8-function decoder used in Atherin Genesis models, which is what we have here. We can also see that there are many other entries for the GN2208. We can go back to the decoder definition that JMRI identified by clicking the radio button at the bottom that says Matched Only. In this case, JMRI only identified one matching decoder definition. In some cases, however, JMRI will identify several, or even many possible decoder definitions, and we will want to select the one that looks like the best match. For example, if we look again at the list of all the decoders in the JMRI database, we can see many other GN2208s as well as the 6-function version, called GN2200. As I mentioned, the example locomotive we are using is a Southern Pacific GP40-2. JMRI labels the decoder in our locomotive as being for a GP40-P-2, the passenger variant of this locomotive. Only three GP40-P-2s were ever built so that Southern Pacific could run passenger trains from San Jose to San Francisco in the days before Caltrain. But model railroaders love to collect models of rare locomotives, and the GP40 P-2 is one such example. Atherin sells Genesis models of not one, not two, but all three of these rare locomotives in multiple paint schemes. So Soundtracks includes steam generator sounds and its diesel decoders for this purpose, and JMRI identifies our decoder as being for the GP40 P-2, even though our locomotive is the standard GP40-2 model. 
Just for curiosity's sake, let's take a look at some of the other possible decoder definitions we might consider. There is a listing for a GN2208 decoder profile for a GP40-2 with ditch lights, which we could use instead. When considering which decoder profile to use, be sure to pay attention to the decoder model number. For example, this decoder for a GP40-2 with dynamic brakes, that's what the DB stands for, and a strobe light might work well for us, except that if we look closely, we will see that it is for the GN2200, which is the six function decoder, and we want the GN2208 eight function decoder. One of the other tricky things about Athern Genesis models is that some use traditional incandescent light bulbs, while others use LEDs. According to Athern, our SP7623 has LEDs. The decoder definition names don't mention this, so we'll want to make sure to check this setting when we program our locomotive. Generally, however, a family of decoders that are all the same model will have the same possible set of CVs and features, so it's not critically important which of the decoder definitions we choose, so long as we choose the correct decoder family and model for our locomotive a Tsunami 2 GN2208 in this example. So for this example, we will just use the decoder definition that JMRI identified for us. If you are unsure which decoder definition to use, you can try opening up a few different ones to see which has the features and settings you expect for your locomotive until you find the right one. You can also find information about selecting a decoder on the JMRI Using Decoder Pro help page. Once we select a decoder definition file, we will click on the button at the bottom to open the comprehensive programmer. This will open the programming window. The first thing we will want to do is give our locomotive an ID and enter its road name and number. We can also enter information about the model manufacturer, owner, and locomotive model and can add comments if we like. We can change this information at any time, but whatever name we enter for the ID now will be used for the file name when we save our locomotive configuration settings to our computer. While we can still change the ID later, the file name saved on our computer will stay the same. In this case, we'll just give the locomotive an ID based on its road name and number. Next, we'll click Save to Roster, close the programmer window and the details for the locomotive will be added to the roster in our JMRI library. It is important to note that when we save the locomotive's configuration file, we are not changing anything on the locomotive. We are simply saving the data in the file to our roster on our computer. It is also important to understand that the data in the roster configuration file is not necessarily the same as the data in the locomotive's decoder. In fact, as we'll see in a moment, the data in the roster file we just saved is nothing like the data in our locomotive. Let's do one more thing before we move on and add a graphic icon to the roster entry for our locomotive. What we want is a nice clean profile side view of our locomotive. We can often find these on a manufacturer's spec sheet or use a photo of our choosing as a starting point. The image for the icon does not need to be very large. We will need to crop and edit the image for size and then save it as a JPEG, GIF, or PNG file. Once we prepare the image we want to use, we'll select our locomotive in the roster and then click the Labels and Media button at the bottom of the Decoder Pro window, just below the Program button. This opens up a simplified programming window with two tabs. The first tab allows us to configure the function buttons on JMRI throttles for our locomotive. We're going to ignore this tab for now and come back to it in the next video. Instead, we'll skip to the second tab, which allows us to add an image and an icon for our locomotive. The way we add these images is by dragging and dropping a suitable graphic file from our computer into the image and icon frames on the tab. So we'll grab the graphic file with the side profile view that we made and drag it into the frame for the locomotive icon. JMRI suggests that we orient the image with the head of the locomotive to the right, but that is just a suggestion and we can ignore it if we like. Our primary focus at the moment is on adding an icon that will be used in the roster window, but if we have a nice photo of our locomotive that we would like to add as the main image, we can certainly do that now, or we can leave that field empty. Once satisfied, we'll click the Save to Roster button at the bottom, and then close the window. 
The icon for our locomotive will now appear in the locomotive roster. We have now added our first locomotive to our JMRI locomotive roster. We'll move on to programming the locomotive decoder next. Step 4. Programming locomotive decoder settings. Now that we've added a locomotive to our roster, let's start programming some of its settings. We'll start by selecting our locomotive in the roster window. Then we'll make sure we are set to program on the programming track by checking the radio buttons at the bottom right corner of the window, and then click the Program button just below that. This will open the Decoder Pro programming window. We can also double click on the roster entry in the roster window as a shortcut to open the programmer using whichever track is selected on the radio buttons. Let's take a few moments to look at the different tabs or screens in the programming window. The first tab is the roster entry and it contains all the information we entered when we first added the locomotive to our roster. Except for the DCC address and the decoder model, we can edit this information at any time and it is only stored in our roster configuration file and not in the locomotive decoder. The next tab or screen is the basic tab and includes the locomotive's DCC address as well as some other basic characteristics of our locomotive. Note that everything is highlighted in yellow. This means that what we are seeing are the values stored in the roster configuration file, not what is in the locomotive's decoder. It is also important to note that none of the information we see here came from the locomotive. Rather, all of this information came from the JMRI decoder definition we selected when we created the roster entry. As we'll see next, it is very different from what is in the locomotive on the track. To see what is actually in the locomotive decoder, we will click the Read Full Sheet button at the bottom of the window. We need to be sure to pay attention when we are clicking these buttons. We don't want to accidentally write information to the locomotive when we are really trying to read it. After we click the Read Full Sheet button, JMRI will start to read the CV settings from the locomotive and the yellow highlights will go away. This lets us know that what we are seeing now is the same information that is stored on the locomotive in the DCC decoder. Now let's go to the next tab. This motor screen shows the settings for various CVs that control how our locomotive runs, including how fast or slowly it accelerates or decelerates. This is sometimes called momentum. Again, we can click Read Full Sheet to see what is actually stored on the locomotive. Finally, let's look at the Lights tab. We can confirm that yes, this definition file is pre-configured for LED lights, which is what we want, although the lighting functions don't match our locomotive. For example, SP7623 has front ditch lights, but there are no ditch lights configured here. But if we read full sheet, we will see that once JMRI imports the locomotive settings, that the lights are configured for forward or front ditch lights. So far, we've tried reading the settings from our locomotive one tab or sheet at a time. Now we'll read them all at once. We can do this from any tab in the programmer window by clicking the Read All Sheets button at the bottom. Again, it is very important that we do not accidentally press the Write All Sheets button by mistake, or else we will lose the current settings on our locomotive before we've even had a chance to save them. JMRI will go through each tab and import the settings from the locomotive's decoder into our programming window. If we follow along, we can see the yellow highlighting being cleared as JMRI updates each setting. Eventually, when JMRI has completed this task, we will see an OK message at the bottom of the screen. We can now save the updated configuration data for our locomotive in our roster. We'll do this by selecting Save from the File menu. If we try to close the programmer window before we save the file, Decoder Pro will warn us that some changes have not been written to the configuration file in our roster. In some cases, we might not want to save the changes and would just click Close, but since right now we do want to save the changes, we'll click the button that says Save and Close. This would be a good time to save a backup copy of our locomotive's roster configuration file. We can do this by exporting the roster entry to our JMRI library. 
To do this, we first select our locomotive in the roster window, then select Export Roster Entry from the File menu. JamRI will ask us to give the export file a new name, after which we can save it to the JamRI library on our computer. Then, if we ever need to go back to this version of our locomotive's roster configuration file with its associated decoder settings, we can choose Import Roster Entry from the File menu. We'll need to make sure we select All Files from the File Format menu at the bottom so we can select the backup file we created. We'll look at how to manage our locomotive rosters further in a future video. But now we are ready to try changing some of the decoder settings on our locomotive. For example, suppose that, like Rick from SoCal Scale Models, whose experience I shared in my last video, we decide that we want to reduce the alternate sound volume for our locomotive's prime mover. He is loud. I should just quiet him down right now. For a Tsunami 2 decoder, we can find this setting on the Alt Sound Levels tab. We can adjust the setting with the slider, or just type the value we want, 30 in this case, in the box. When we do this, the highlighting in the box will change to orange instead of yellow or white. This lets us know that this is a setting that we've changed, but that has not yet been saved. So far, this change exists only in our programmer window. We have not saved it to our roster or sent the change to our locomotive. To program this change to our locomotive's decoder, we will click the Write Changes on Sheet button at the bottom of the window. This will reprogram the locomotive decoder CV that controls the alternate sound level for the prime mover with the new value that we just entered. Finally, we can save this change in the locomotive configuration file in our JamRI roster by choosing Save from the File menu. Now let's look at another example. Using the default Atherin settings on the Tsunami 2 decoder, the F4 function button on the throttle activates the dynamic brake setting, while F11 activates the independent brake or train brake, depending on function F12. But on my small 1 foot by 6 foot D saver switching puzzle layout, I constantly use the independent brake. To make it easier to use the independent brakes on my throttle, I swapped its function assignment with the dynamic brakes. So the independent brake is now on F4, and the dynamic brake is now on F11. But what if we wanted to switch them back? We can easily do that on the Function Map tab. We'll just set the independent train brake back to the original F11 setting, and set the dynamic brake back to F4. Again, we'll see these changes highlighted in orange. To complete the reprogramming, we'll press the Write Changes on Sheet button. While we're at it, we might also want to check to see how the dynamic brakes affect the momentum settings. We can find this setting on the Advanced tab. Here we can see that currently the dynamic brake function has no effect on our locomotive's braking. We can change this by adjusting the setting to apply an effect from the dynamic braking function. Since we want our dynamic brakes to help slow down our locomotive, we will subtract the dynamic brake effect from the train's momentum, or braking delay, thereby helping to slow it down. Again, we can write changes on sheet to save these changes to our locomotive. While we have now written or saved all these changes to our locomotive, we have not yet saved them to the locomotive configuration file in our JMRI roster. If we try to close the programmer window now, JMRI will warn us that some of the changes have not been saved to the configuration file. If we only want these changes to be temporary and plan to change them back in the near future, we might intentionally decide not to save them in the configuration file and simply click the Close button. This way we can easily revert back to our regular settings by using the Write All Sheets button when we are ready to do so. On the other hand, if we intend to keep these changes for a while, we can select Save and Close and our roster entry will continue to match what is stored in the CVs of the locomotive decoder. We'll take a closer look at some of these strategies for managing our locomotive roster files in a future video. The Tsunami 2 is a very complex and sophisticated DCC locomotive decoder with many different features and settings, some of which interact with each other in unexpected ways. We have already seen a glimpse of this in the examples we looked at. We'll dive into more details of programming the Tsunami 2 and some of its idiosyncrasies in a future video. We've just spent a fair amount of time importing a locomotive into our roster and programming a few CVs, and it may seem like a daunting task, but it's really quite simple. Let's add another locomotive and I'll show you. 
Here's another Atherin Genesis GP40-2, this time Union Pacific 1390. As before, we'll place the locomotive on the programming track and press New Loco. JMRI will identify the locomotive and decoder. This time we can see that we have a GP40-2 with dynamic brakes and strobes with a GN2200 decoder. This is the six function version of the Tsunami 2 diesel decoder used in some Atherin Genesis locomotives. We'll open the comprehensive programmer, give our locomotive an ID, road name, and number, and save it to our roster. Then we simply press read all sheets and wait for JMRI to read all the CVs from the locomotive. Then we can save the file and close the window. We can also add an icon to the roster media tab in the labels and media programmer just as we did before. We now have a new roster entry that includes all the CV settings for our second locomotive and we can use that roster entry to reprogram the locomotive whenever we want. We're ready to run some trains. Step five, let's run some trains. Now that we've added and configured some locomotives in our JMRI locomotive roster, let's run some trains. We'll place our locomotives back on the main track, select the one we want to run from the roster, and click on the throttle button at the bottom of the Decoder Pro window, just next to the Labels and Media button. This will open a default JMRI throttle for our locomotive. The function buttons will be labeled with the default JMRI settings for those buttons based on the decoder profile we used when we first added the locomotive to the roster. We'll look at how to customize the buttons in the next video. We'll also look at how to customize the throttle speed controller, which is on the left, and how to use the locomotive address panel and consist tool. But for now, let's run some trains. RPM Plus will start up the prime mover. Brake Select will charge up the train brake air pipe. Then we'll turn on the headlight, strobe and ditch lights. Ring the bell, sound two blasts of the horn, and we're ready to roll. Notch up the throttle and move on out. All aboard! Just watch out where you click in the speed controller window and use caution with your mouse's scroll wheel or your locomotive may learn how to fly. Briefly. What's next? Customizing JMRI throttles. In my next video, I will show you how to customize and use JMRI throttles, including how to add graphics to the throttles and how to set up keyboard shortcuts to operate all the throttle functions. After that, we'll look at how to use the Y throttle and engine driver apps with JMRI and DCCEX to run our trains. And we'll look at some of the different kinds of hardware throttles we can use with JMRI and DCCEX together. In later videos, we'll look at some of the additional strategies we can use to manage our JMRI locomotive rosters, including how to compare decoder settings between two locomotives, how to reset our locomotives to their factory settings, and how to save those configuration profiles for future use. We'll also look at some of the JMRI features specifically designed for DCCEX and how to use them. We're just getting started on this journey, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the view as the scenery rolls by. Until then, thanks for watching. Well, Scratchy? Have you finished your inspection of the train? All right then. Let's get rolling. All aboard!